Okay, good evening, everyone. I think we'll get started now with this great program for tonight. My name is Joyce Kennedy, and I'm the Director of Community Relations here at Concordia College. And on behalf of the college, I welcome you all to this very special program, Pursuing Your Passion, featuring Tina Zaccardi, an East Chester resident who, in 2018, won the Great American Baking Show Holiday Edition. So we are so pleased that Tina is here with us tonight. And when I first saw that Tina had won the show, um, I called her, or actually I think I sent you a private Facebook message and said, would you like to come to Concordia and tell the community your story about this incredible journey and how you ended up being the winner of this amazing show? Uh, Tina and I have known each other for many years. Our children went through uh, Grammar Waverly, uh, East Greenville, East Chester Middle School, East Chester High School. Her daughter, Christina, is here tonight with us. Her husband, Vin, Vinny, and her dad. And give a shout out to dad. All with cameras, I might add, so they'll be getting some good photo, photo footage here for us tonight. So anyway, so let's get started. So what, I mean, we just have so many questions for you, and you and I have talked a couple of times about, you know, what happened in the show and everything else. And so, but let's kind of start at the beginning. Where does your passion for baking, where did that come from? Well, it, it started with what, I guess what a lot of people start with, watching their grandmother, watching their mother um, bake. And they were, they were good bakers. And, um, you know, from there, it, would, it just kind of, spiraled into something that I found that I was good at and that I would get oohs and ahs when I would bake something and it was kind of something to set me apart from my two brothers, you know, something that was mine, that was unique to me and it's just been really a lifelong love of baking that I've had. It's just turned into a, a, a real passion. Well, I want to thank you because all of us on the PTA always thanked you for the wonderful <laughs> baked goods that you would bring. But the rest of us, to shame like me, would buy something store-bought and put a little confectioner sugar on the top. But let's take a look at um, Tina's family history of baking. I am baking a double chocolate coffee cake. What's Italian actually about this is that I'm using my hands a lot. If you can... <laughs> I gotta throw that in there. <laughs> Tina got her start in baking, watching her Italian mother and grandmother kick starting a lifelong obsession with the craft. Now, with children of her own, she keeps the tradition alive by developing new recipes to pass down. Wow, that's amazing. So, I know you were tenacious in your quest to get on this show, and you tried several times. So, tell us a little bit about the process, and also why this particular show? Well, this, this whole thing started maybe about five or six years ago. I'm sitting on my couch on a Sunday afternoon flipping channels, and I come across Channel 13 PBS, and what's on is the Great British Bake Off. And after 10 minutes, I was hooked. The, you know, just the fact that I'm a baker and just the, the really nice format of the show. There's no animosity. There's no throwing each other under the bus. They're actually helping each other, cheering each other on. So I kind of fell in love with this show. And I said to myself, if we do anything here in the States, um, do our own version of it, I, I, I have to get on it. I have to um, audition for it. So about two years later... Um, they aired the very first season, the Great American Baking Show, and I totally missed the audition for that. I didn't even know how to look for it or how to even get started. The second year, um, I figured it out, found the application online, and I got all the way through and became an alternate. Um, but I never got on the show. Nobody got sick. Nobody, you know, dropped out. Um, you know, so... <laughs> So then the year after that, which was been the third season, I auditioned again and got as far as I could go without being picked. Um, but this year, um, I guess third time's a charm, and I went, took it as, I guess, as far as you could take it. <laughs> That's great. And I also understand that at the same time, uh, you were pursuing a scholarship at the Institute of Culinary Education and had to make a decision. Tell us a little bit about that. Right. They, there's a culinary school down in Lower Manhattan, the Institute of Culinary uh, Education, ICE for short, and they were running a scholarship contest. And it, that was one of the other things, besides trying to be on a, a national baking show, was to maybe go to culinary school and really, you know, get certified, get a degree, um, being taken a little more seriously. Um, so I applied for that um, contest, and I was actually picked as a finalist. And just as this whole audition process for the show was starting, 
um, I got the call and said, you're a finalist in this contest. And I had to think long and hard, what do I really want? And the reason I had to think about it was that one of the requirements for the Great American Baking Show is that you cannot be a um, uh, trained culinary professional. You cannot have gone to culinary school. You had to have been self-taught home baker you know, nothing um, formal. So I decided, which was a really gutsy move, to give that up so I could pursue this because this is what I really wanted to do. So I think I made the right decision. <laughs> Absolutely. So after so many tries, you've now been selected as a contestant and you're now on the air with 10, well, actually nine other bakers, there are 10 total. And everyone is from across the country and all walks of life. So the opening round is Cake Week. And it was a bit up and down for you at the beginning. Yes, it was. <laughs> um, your coffee cake got stuck in the pan, the flourless cake, you came in seventh place, and then the showstopper didn't go as planned. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, so, you know, it's the first week, and with any reality show, the, the last thing you want to do is be voted out first. You know, no, <laughs> nobody wants that. Um, so, you know, when my coffee cake didn't come out as expected, I was like, okay, it's just the first round, we've got two more to go. And then our technical challenge was a flourless um, chocolate cake with a French meringue, and that went okay. I came in seventh out of 10, which wasn't horrible, at least I wasn't last. And then I had a little problem with um, my showstopper. Well, let's take a look at what happened with that showstopper cake. They're not even cooked, they've been in there 40 minutes. They're raw. I'm starting again and I'm making a totally different cake. I'm not going down without a fight. Please take less time to bake so that will really, really help. Please bring your mini cakes to the judging table. Did you switch things out on us? I remember when we visited, there was a pumpkin cake involved. Yes, there was. I switched gears. I made a chocolate cake that I have right up here. I didn't need a piece of paper for it. I like to call them my autumn harvest cakes. They're perfect. They look perfect. Your piping is beautiful. I could go in the shop window of any bakery in America. Thank you. Oh. Oh, a little surprise inside as well. A surprise. That is absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. If you bake a lot, you, you do retain recipes in your head. That's the mark of someone who understands baking at its core. Come back, queen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, that was certainly the comeback queen. She was <laughs> nailed that one for sure. So again, here you started with this pumpkin cake and ended up doing another cake. Tell us a little bit about that cake um, that sort of saved the day for you. Yeah, so what they didn't show on television was what actually happened. Um, we are given all our ingredients. They're all labeled. They're all in containers. They're all on our bench for us. The culinary team is absolutely fantastic. Um, and I had cream of tartar, baking powder, and baking soda on my bench. And... I must have grabbed the cream of tartar instead of either baking powder or baking soda, which just caused the cake to just not rise, to just totally flatten. And I didn't realize it at the time. I'm thinking, okay, maybe the ratios in my recipe are off. So I said, you know what? I don't want to take the chance and remake the same cake. I asked my producer, because um, we we're assigned a producer who goes around and asks you questions while you're baking, which can be a little nerve-wracking. <laughs> um, and I said, how much time do I have left? They said, you have a little over an hour. So I, you know, pulled myself together, um, asked the culinary team for all the extra ingredients I needed to make this chocolate cake that I have memorized in my head that I've been baking for a long time. And it just all came together, thankfully so. And I was able to, um, you know, pull myself out of the hole that I had dug during the first two rounds. <laughs> I guess I should have reminded people to shut up their cell phones. Sorry about that. I usually do. <laughs> So week three, or cookie week, um, you really shine, outshined all the other bakers. There was no doubt about it. In fact, right out of the gate, you nailed it in the signature bake with your arugula, and you kept the winning pace up throughout the entire challenge. You also had one of your first personal victories that I know was on your bucket list for this show. Let's see what happened. You've got great color, I'll tell you that. Wow. That's what I'm talking about. The flavors, the textures, mm. the crispiness, the butteriness, the bake all the way through. 
oh, the flavour. Emotional. <laughs> so emotional. See what that Hollywood handshake wow. does? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> did not expect that when I woke up this morning. <laughs> I guess you did not expect no, that when I you did. woke up this morning. So <laughs> what did, did that not. feel like? I mean, Paul Hollywood giving you the handshake. You know, if, if my time on the show had ended there, I think I would have been happy. Going into the competition, um, there were, you know, a couple of things, a couple of goals that I wanted to achieve. And one of them on my bucket list was get a Paul Hollywood handshake. And for anybody that watches the Great British Bake Off or even, you know, the Great American Baking Show, is getting a handshake from Paul is like the gold standard. Is That means he just absolutely loves whatever you're eating. So I was thrilled when I saw that hand go out. I was, I was in shock. I was, it was the most exciting thing that had happened to me up until then. That was amazing. And that wasn't the end of the excitement for you during Cookie Week. Um, you, had your, you finished off the week with your Trim the Tree cookie tart, cookie cream tart, excuse me, in the Showstopper, and it was a big hit with the judges. Let's see what happened with that. Look so festive. I think your macarons are beautiful. You have two tangs coming from the raspberry and the lemon as well. It's ingenious, it really is, because I think it works. We've been saying throughout the competition, bake it, caramel equals flavor, and you've done it perfectly with the sablé. Thank you. Well, certainly the judges love that cookie cream tart. And I understand that you are teaching a course at the Bronxville Adult School. I'd like to give a little shout out to the Bronxville Adult School. They're partners of ours here at the, the college. Tell us a little bit about that cookie cream tart and you know, wh why that special so, to you as well. So last week and the week before, I did two um, classes through the Bronxville um, Adult School. And they were for a cookie cream tart. And um, not many people know what they are. Um, I did a little research when I found out that we'd be baking one, and it, um, the information I could find on the Internet was that it was developed by an Israeli pastry chef. And what it is is instead of cake, it's two layers of either a butter or a sugar cookie sandwiched with some kind of cream. For me, I used um, a uh, mascarpone whipped cream in mine on the show. And um, it's decorated traditionally with macarons or uh, meringue cookies and fresh fruit. And you can make it as festive as you want. And they kind of started out as numbers for birthdays. Like if someone's celebrating a 12th birthday, you'd have a one and a two. And then it just kind of morphed into um, pretty much any shape you could possibly imagine. Wow. So your next big goal was significant, and you achieved it not once but twice. Let's take a look at your first win as star baker for the cookie challenge. This week was tough, but one of you handled the pressure like a true cookie monster. The star baker is Tina. Congratulations. Wow, that was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> How did you feel? Oh, it was, you know, that was one of the second things to get star baker. I, you know, I had some stiff competition. Um, you know, all, you know, nine other people were just fantastic bakers. So I was up against some, like, again, some pretty stiff competition. But that was just the most thrilling moment, you know, to get a handshake and then get Star Baker in the same, same week, same episode was just unbelievable. Wow. So you had a Star Baker under your belt and the infamous handshake. And you were in a great spot going into the bread competition with six bakers now remaining. So at the onset of the bread competition, you made an interesting comment that cookies and bread are two very different things. Tell us what happened during the bread competition. Yeah, cookies and bread are, are definitely, for anybody who bakes, knows that they are just worlds of, she's shaking her head, worlds <laughs> apart. You know, with bread and, and uh, you know, you're dealing with yeast, you're dealing with proofing, um, the, the temperature, the humidity, the, you know, your, you know, Anything that's going on in your kitchen could really affect the bread. As, as, but with cookies, they're a little easier. Um, they're a little more forgiving than, than bread. Um, so we started off the bread week with flatbread. So, you know, being Italian, I'm thinking flatbread, okay, pizza. So, yeah, no, that's not what they were looking for. <laughs> they, were, they were looking for the more traditional Middle Eastern softer texture flatbread. So, Paul, you know... It was good for what it was, but it wasn't um, what they were looking for for that particular challenge. And, you know, Paul called me out on it, which was perfectly fine. I 
I took it like a trooper. So then the, um, our second um, bake, which was a technical bake, which um, for anybody that doesn't know, there were three um, different as three different baking um, challenges within each episode. The first one is your signature. So they ask you to make something and you put your own little twist on it. Um, the second one is the technical and you have no idea what's coming at you. Um, you don't know until you lift the box and find the ingredients in the recipe. And the third one is the showstopper, which is probably the most grand of um, any of the bakes um, previous to that. So with the technical, we had to make something called a kennelang, which is a um, Swedish um, yeast bread, um, similar to um, a cinnamon roll, but in one big, big bread. So um, I did, I didn't come in last, so, you know, thank God for that. Um, but what saved me was um, my bread sculpture, which I was stressing out the most. I mean, I must have tried five, six, seven different things at home that summer before we left, figuring out what I wanted to do and what sculpture. And because bread's really hard to work with. And I even said it on the show that, um, you know, you shape something and then it has to proof once and it, the shape changes a little. And then um, you bake it and there's a little more rise in the oven. So the shape's changing again. So it's really a difficult medium to work with. But um, when all was said and done, Paul really liked the flavors of my bread. They liked the whole... Um, sculpture, so uh, I, w I was really happy, and um, that week was, um, you had to get by that week in order to get into the semifinal, so that was really a really stressful week. Well, I imagine it was, and you did make it through, and you did make it to the semifinals. So now you're there with Amanda, and Andrea, Destiny, and Jivan, and so instead of being nervous, it was interesting to watch, you really seemed to channel your energy into taking some Really creative risks. Um, tell us about some of the risks that you took during that particular um, challenge and what made, how that made you stand out from the other bakers. So um, for the signature bake, which is our first one, we had to do um, six identical pot de cremes, which is kind of a French custard. And I chose to kind of look outside the box for my flavors, and I chose two ingredients that are normally thought of as savory ingredients, goat cheese and balsamic vinegar. So I put the, um, uh, the goat cheese um, into the sweet, as part of the sweetened custard, and I made a, um, a honey balsamic glaze to go on top with fresh figs. And um, they really liked it. They really appreciated the fact that I went um, the extra mile and thought outside the box and, and, you know, combined some interesting flavors instead of, you know, something a little more pedestrian. Um, but uh, Sherry loved it. In fact, she almost ate the whole thing. And you can see the, 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 the empty custard cup on my station. So that, I, I was thrilled. I was so happy that they enjoyed it because when they came around to talk to each one of us about what you were baking, I said to them, I said, you're either going to love it or you're going to hate it. So I was really thrilled when they loved it. <laughs> yes, they absolutely did. And then um, the technical challenge was a princess cake where you came in second, um, did very well with that. And then for the showstopper was your winter woodland wonderland gingerbread, yes. which Paul described as both beautiful and yes. flavorful. Um, it was just, talk a little bit about that. Well, what was really exciting for me about the, um, the gingerbread creation was I think I left home and I knew that it was um, the fifth out of the six weeks. And you, you don't even expect to get, you know, I would have been happy with getting by, you know, to the second or third week. But I really wanted to do that gingerbread um, creation. I do a gingerbread creation every year for... Um, for Christmas, and I was so excited to do it, and, and I was so glad that I got that far, got to the, just got to the semifinals, so I was able to, you know, create that. So that was a really huge for me. Well, let's take a look at what the judges had to say about that beautiful gingerbread creation. This is my winter woodland wonderland. It's kind of a whimsical depiction of what you might see on any given winter day in my backyard. Brilliant. Very, very clever. I love this painting on the roof. It's all freehand? All freehand, yep. Very clever. <laughs> beautiful snap. You know, it's got a real depth of ginger in there, which is beautiful. Tastes delicious, looks amazing. Thank you, Tina. Who do I call to get one of these? <gasps> Me. <laughs> 
This is the showstopper that helps decide who goes home and who goes to the finals. Did these gingerbread scenes make it clear who should stay and who should go? I think it did help, ultimately. I think, obviously, Sherry and I need to discuss stuff and see who goes where. When we look at the three that were down at the bottom, Destiny struggled, I think, with their flavour. Too much molasses in there. I thought Jeevan's, on the other hand, tasted amazing, but there was an issue with the cast. I just thought it was a little bit rough and ready. Andrea's looked amazing, but her cookie was a little bit too soft. They all had good bits and bad bits of their, their showstopper. That must be so hard. Creativity is key for me. Whether it's in flavour or in design, it's something that Sherry and I have to sit down seriously and discuss which of the two people are going to go home after this challenge. Wow. What a journey so far. Three of you are moving on to the finals, while two of you will be leaving the tent. The star baker is Tina. Wow. <laughs> How did that make you feel? <laughs> oh, that made me, oh, gosh, that made me feel really great. I, I, I was really surprised because everybody's gingerbread house just looked beautiful. And um, it, it, was, it was, really was a surprise that I got Star Baker again. Well, it was so interesting today. We were going through the, the video cuts here, and um, there was a student worker in the office with us, and she said she watched that particular when he cut into your gingerbread creation, and she said, I cried when he did that. I was watching the show. I mean, yeah, because, well, they, they, um, we had to move it. We had, once we created it, it was on our bench, and then we had to move it to a table because then they did the beauty shots and took videos of it, and then um, they had to bring it back to our bench, and we had to sit there, and they took pictures of us with, with it. So they, ABC had a legal person that was on set the entire time, and she would not let anybody handle the gingerbread houses but yourself because they didn't want to be responsible for anybody dropping it. So, yeah. <laughs> Yes, that would not be something no. that someone would want to be responsible for. So now you've made it through the semifinals. And it's down to the grand finale. And it's Amanda and Andrea and you as the three remaining. And as Paul says, the one who wins is the one who shows up. So first up is the signature bake with the cannolis. And the judges love your flavors. Um, but Paul does mention that your shell's wrapped a little too much. Just a little too much. Just a little too much. Just um, much. Just that much. <laughs> And in the technical, tell us a little bit about the technical um, challenge and what was, what was that all about. So, so the technical challenge is something that I had seen made before because I watched the British show but had never made. It was called a bomb cook cooking. And what it is is, is 20-layer cake um, covered in chocolate. And the way the 20 layers are put together, it's basically a sponge cake, and you put a very, very tiny amount in the pan, and it's broiled. It's not even baked. And then you take it out, and you put another layer, and you broil it. And another, yes. And she's, she's like shaking her head. And I'm like, yeah, yep. 20, 20 layers. So we had to, I had to weigh the ingredients, and then divide by 20, and find out how many grams. I mean, we were like to the, yeah, we had to weigh. It was, it was crazy. It was really stressful. Um, so that was the, uh, the, the technical bake. And like I said, I had seen it made, but I had never made one myself. So I was, you know, we were just all flying blind. We really were. <laughs> well, I'm certainly sure the cannoli was a little bit more familiar to you yes, than that it 20 was. Yes, it was. Cake. So now you're down to the 18th and yeah. final bake of the show. The last one. And it's your last shot at winning the coveted cake plate that everyone wants. <laughs> And your showstopper is, the description is they want a holiday celebration cake yep. with a crunch. So tell us what you created for that showstopper. So for this showstopper cake, um, I decided to keep with my Italian roots. So um, we, had to do, we had to do three tiers. So two tiers I made was a chocolate cake. Um, I uh, filled it with espresso mousse. And I put, for our, my crunchy element, I crumbled up biscotti almond biscotti, and put them in with, with the mousse. The last tier, um, everybody must know that the quintessential Italian cookie, those three-layered cookies, the yellow, the green, uh, you know, the yellow, the green, and the um, red-striped cookies that are in every single bakery. So I thought I'd do like a little riff on that. And what I did was I did an, um, an almond sponge cake, which those cookies have almond paste in, so I kept that almond flavor. And I colored the three layers, the red, the yellow,
the yellow and the green, and I fill them with, um, normally I like to fill them with apricot preserves. Some people do um, raspberry preserves. So I did an apricot buttercream and covered the whole thing in chocolate. And um, I got good reviews from the judges, um, so I was, I was really happy with that. But it was a lot of fun to, to put this cake together, to figure it out. And I had a vision of how I wanted it to look, and that kind of went right out the window. I mean, up until like the night before, I was still figuring out how I wanted this cake to look. So um, you can plan for stuff, and sometimes it doesn't work. And that was one of the examples where I was just kind, kind of flying by the seat of my pants. <laughs> It certainly did work. And in case anyone missed that part of the show, we'd like to have you see this festive Christmas cake again. Please bring your final showstopper up to the judging table. It's a very busy cake, isn't it? Yes. While there's a lot going on, you're piping. It's very well done. It looks good. But what's it taste like? <laughs> Beautiful, perfect, even layers. It's a great cake, but I think it works, the chocolate and the coffee together. It's perfectly balanced, it's not, one's not overwhelming another. And the biscotti element also adds another texture to the cake, which I think is exceptional. <laughs> Beautiful job. Well, let's try the next one. Very clever to bring in the Italian flag again. I love the moistness of the cake, the apricot, could use a little more punch. Okay. I think you've done a very, very good cake, if a little bit busy. Thank you. <laughs> Paul. <laughs> he seems to like the more simplistic approach of many things. Maybe if you'd yeah. use the British flag instead of the Italian maybe, flag, maybe, he might maybe. have liked it a little bit better, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> certainly. So now is the moment of truth. And, you know, you, your family, your friends, four million Americans have been waiting for, and it's the announcement of the winner of the Great American Baking Show. You spent 25 intense days. You did 18 incredibly complex bakes with nine total strangers. And all the while, you're pretending that it's the holiday time in the middle of August in a tent in England. Yeah, they had, they had the, you could see the fire going. They had us have the blankets on us. But, I mean, who are we fooling? <laughs> I mean, with the lush greenery there, we, you knew it wasn't Christmas time. But you did a good job fooling everyone. So let us see your victory once again. It is the moment of truth. Okay. Ladies, thank you so much for sharing your passion of baking. What touches me most is how you're inspiring bakers everywhere, as your skills and your confidence have grown. I've judged quite a few baking competitions over the years, and actually watching you three get better and better and better, that's what it's all about. You should all be very proud of yourselves. All right, all right. Enough of the sweet stuff. <laughs> the winner of the Great American Baking Show Holiday Edition is... I can't believe that I did it. I actually did it. Congratulations! You deserve it, Tina. Well done. Tina's been on a journey from the very beginning and got better and better and better. She's got such a talent. I hope she carries on teaching the next generation how to bake. I'll buy a book. She needs to do a book. <laughs> well done. Tina can bake like nobody's business. She puts passion into everything she bakes. And it's been a thrill to watch Tina challenge herself and push boundaries. That's what baking's all about. You did it! Holiday edition! <laughs> Tina, I'm just so happy for her. Just so deserved. And you know what? This is an over the moon experience of a lifetime that I will never forget. has been so important in my life because it's connected me with my past and having my family here to help me celebrate 
the completion of this journey is such a prize. Thanks, guys. If you keep believing, you keep working hard, you can, you can do anything. You, you can do anything. Even at 56, you can do it. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, Amazing. wow. <laughs> it's still wow. <laughs> and, and then you, like, you come home and you, you, know, you can't tell anyone that you've, no, again, been on this can't. amazing journey. You've got your plate. Tell us a little bit about how you kept that secret. Um, so this ended um, the end of August. I came home August 25th, and we knew that the show wasn't airing until December 6th. So that was a long, yeah, that was a long time for me to have to keep this secret. There were a couple people that knew. My husband and my daughter knew the outcome. My son did not want to know. He wanted to be surprised, but he was already at school. Um, and I had a few very close friends who knew where I was and what I was doing. And when I came home, they were like, well, what, what happened? I said, I can't tell you. What do you mean you can't tell? What do you mean you can't tell? I said, I can't tell you. Oh. And then there were some that were like, oh, you didn't win, or yeah, you won. And that, you, know, you had to keep that poker face. There were a couple of times where I almost slipped. It was really, really hard. Um, but finally, in the um, middle of November, they finally issued the press release where we were actually allowed to um, tell everybody that we were actually on the show, which was a little bit of a relief. It was, it was, that was the most fun, to just let everybody finally know what I had been doing <laughs> the whole month of August. So, yeah, it was crazy. And how did you get that cake plate home? Did you check that? Did you yeah. trust the airlines, or what yeah, so, did you do with it? Uh, so I didn't, I didn't check it. I, I carried it on with me. It wasn't, it wasn't getting out of my hands. And um, uh, we, uh, I flew out of Gatwick, at, um, not Heathrow, and went through security, and it was kind of flagged. And so the, you know, the security person took it out of the bag, took it out of the box, opened up the other box, and, well, looked at it, but... I said, they said, what's in the box? And I said, it's a Waterford crystal platter. And he kind of saw that it, that's what it was. Didn't read any of the, the inscription on it. Thank God. I would have gotten into a big trouble. Um, and uh, they said, okay, you're, you're set to go through. So I did, I did carry it on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. Your secret would have been out, I'm yes. sure. And do you keep in touch with the other bakers? You know, again, you spend so much time with these people day and night and you know, all the stress and the ups and downs. Do you keep in touch with them? Yeah, we, we, we got to be very close very quickly. It was, you know, this was my family in, in England, and we all supported each other. We picked each other up when we were down. We cheered when somebody did something great. You know, we went to lunch. We went to dinner. A um, couple of us even crashed a birthday party at a restaurant we went to. Um, so we got really close, and, you know... Um, I'm close. There's a couple of people that I'm still really close with. We, you know, group chat. We have our, you know, our message group that we chat. And I've even gotten together with a couple of them already, you know, kind of a little mini reunion. So, yeah, we're all very close. We're, we know what each other has been through. So that's what, you know, really brought us all together. And another thing. So you're doing all this. And was there any sort of lucky charm that you had? Did you have a lucky coin in your pocket? Did you wear some special socks or turn them inside out? Or um, was, did you say a novena every day? I mean, what, you know, what did you do to, you know, have that little sort of lucky charm there for you? Or did you not? So there, there's a, I have a, um, a, a silver necklace and it's a whisk. And I wore that for every competition Every, you know, every time we were on set, I, ha I had it on. So if you watch the show, you'll see that I have it on. So that was kind of my, my good luck charm. The second thing that I did, and, and while not a really superstitious person, you have to respect the streak. And if you're doing something and you feel that it's helping you to move forward, don't stop doing it. So the way they transported us back and forth from the hotel to the studio was a bus. And we had the exact same bus every single day and going, going and coming, and I sat in the exact same seat from day one to the day of the finals, and funny story, um, there were a couple of things that they were transporting, and a couple of big boxes, and they didn't want to bring them to the back of the bus, so um, I'm sitting in my seat, and 
one of the people on the bus for the show says, Tina, do you mind moving back a seat so we can put that, you know, this box there? And I hear from the back of the bus, one of my fellow contestants, she's not moving, so you're going to have to put that box somewhere else. So everybody kind of knew, every, every, you know, we all, it, it, funny, we all kind of sat in the same spot in the bus, even when we were down to three of us, we were all, you know, <laughs> so we, we, I kept my seat through the, the whole competition. That's great. And Paul mentioned at the end of the show, and you know, after you've been crowned the winner, um, he said, she's got a cookbook. She needs to write a cookbook. I'll buy it. W what's next? You know, um, everybody's been asking me what's next. So um, right now, I'm trying to, um, you know, just keep baking. I've been baking a lot. I put out a lot on Instagram, a lot on Facebook. Um, I had the opportunity, which was really great, to teach some classes through the Bronxville Adult Ed. In fact, I'm doing another one in um, May on Danish pastry. Um, I've done a few product collaborations. They send you product. You create a recipe for them. So that's been fun. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know what's next. I'm, you know, trying some new things, you know, investigating different avenues. So hopefully you're going to see more of me and hear more of me. Um, I do want to try doing like a pop-up um, somewhere in either Bronxville or East Chester or Tuckahoe where I'll let you know where I'll be and I'll be selling a, a certain amount of things. So that's kind of in the works. So um, hopefully, you know, more things to come. But as far as the cookbook, I'm thinking about it. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll have to see. Yes. The one in the middle, um, your recipe to follow, right? Um, so the one in the middle is the technical, and we don't know what it is. So they give us, they do give us a recipe, but there are things that they leave out. Cooking time, um, the method to create, like for the... Um, the flourless chocolate cake with the French meringue, all it said was make a French meringue. And there are like three or four different ways to make a meringue, so you need to know what the French method is. Also, my yes. question is, how do you perfect the recipes when you have to go on Okay. So um, during the summer, we were given, you know, about a month to practice our recipe. So I'm, there were a couple of things that I made like two, three, four times, tweaking it, changing it, adding a little of this, adding a little of that to make it exactly the, you know, the way I wanted to. So, yes. What do you think the secret sauce is making the show feel so good, like that people want to really want and cheering on your competitors? Okay, um, the question was, um, is there any, what's the secret to the show having the feel that it does, that it's the camaraderie and everything? Um, honestly, I don't think there's any special um, recipe for that. No, no pun intended. Um, it, it's, it lends itself to that kind of show. They, when we do our little interviews, like after, after we've competed, after a, a, a series of bakes or whatever, um, they're not looking for us to throw any of our competitors under the bus. They're not asking us to, to talk trash about another competitor. And we're in such close quarters. You know, we, we were all at the same hotel. We all had our own rooms, though. But you're, you're living with... It, that's why one of the reasons why I wanted to do this show, because you're not talking trash. They're giving you legitimate amounts of time to complete a task. There are some other baking shows where it's like, okay, we need a thousand cupcakes in an hour and a half. It's just physically impossible to do. So this show just lends itself to, to being that way. It really is a, it was really a, a great format. Um, everybody was super nice. Um, the, even, the judges, the hosts, I mean, we had the best time off off the screen, you know, when we weren't taping with Emma and Spice Adams, they were really hy hysterical. They were so funny. So it was just a really all around nice experience. So, yes. I find that baking is therapy and it's very, very, uh, I, don't, I make by myself, but I make a lot of cookies at Christmas and I always feel, always brings me back to my family and what they did. Do you still feel that same way after doing this contest that it's like therapy and you love to do it forever and ever? Or yeah. Do you yeah, so baking, yes, definitely baking as therapy. You can find me in the kitchen most, most days doing something, baking something. Um, yes, I do. I mean, yes, this was a very stressful experience, but um, after the second or third week, you start to calm down. You know what's going to happen. You know 
the whole format, you know, you start to get a camaraderie with your producer. I was lucky enough to have the same person from week two to the very end asking me questions, the same camera crew, which, is, which was really nice because it gave you a little sense of, um, it made you a little more calm. You, you knew you could start to get a rapport with the person. But, yeah, I do, do believe that, yeah, baking can be very, very relaxing, you know, kind of put you in the zone, kind of forget about everything else. Um, yes, right here. Yes, I, I definitely have made carrot cake. I love carrot cake. <laughs> um, yes. um, to that lady's point, baking and cooking to me is, is therapy. There's no TV on. I prefer no people around. It's just my little escape. And whenever I watch a, a contest like that, I have to shut it off because I see a person, oh my God, something happened, how do I fix it? But I only have seven seconds. And, and that takes the whole um, flavor of it. It seems like you, they gave you an adequate amount of time to either redirect how you were going to complete something. You didn't feel that type of anxiety or, or did you just hide it well? <laughs> well, yeah, it, it's a combination of, of everything. Yes, you try and hide it, but eventually your emotion, I mean, you get emotional. You'll, they'll, they'll come out. I mean, your 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 personality comes out. Your your you know, um, but um, yeah, it it's it's interesting because they did give you enough time to complete whatever baking task they gave you. There was there were some that were on a really little bit like the cookie cream tart. It was a really tight time commitment. You know, it, it was like, you better not, you know, misstep, because if you do, you're, you're not going to finish. But um, yes, it, yes, it was stressful. Yeah, there were times where it was very stressful. But this is just something that I wanted to do for so long that it was just, I was so lucky to be given this opportunity, um, you know, to do this, that I was picked out of, I don't know how many thousands of applications that, um, you know, they got. So... Anybody else? Yes. So is, is everybody as scared of Paul as they seem to be gone? What's the group like? Well, yeah, we all started out quaking in our boots. Um, <laughs> but you know what? He, he judged us, I believe, fairly. And, you know, you, you, there were things that I didn't do exactly right, and you knew the criticism is coming. You, you know it's coming, and I think they, he was very fair. Same thing with Sherry. They gave, and they gave really good constructive criticism. Sometimes he be a little harsher on people than others, but um, he's, a, he's a good guy. He, um, you know, made us feel comfortable. He didn't, you know, he, you know, but those piercing blue eyes, they're like, look right through you. It's like, and after like the second or third week, you, you, you have a rapport with him and, and he gets to know you and you get to know him. So, um, yeah, I mean, he, off camera, he was a little standoffish because I think he doesn't want to get to know you because that will affect how he judges. He wants to be very impartial. Yes. Um, you know what? People have asked me that. I don't think that that's the route I'm going to go. It's really a lot of hard work. It's a lot of long hours. It's a lot of getting up early. So I'm trying to possibly get my baked goods out to people but doing it in a, just a different way than a brick and mortar store. Any other questions? Oh, yes. You know, I find as I'm cooking that the ingredients of the recipes I used to cook are less relevant now as times are changing and people's tastes are changing and people aren't wanting as much sugar and things like that. Do you see your recipes evolving? And if so, what are some of the recipes that you find that you make now more that you wouldn't have made before? Um, you know, there are some recipes that I've been baking forever. Um, there are certain cookies that if I don't make them at Christi Christmas time, I get yelled at. Um, so, you know, there, and, but then again, there are things that I will create that are new. Um, as far as um, sugar, I mean, it's baking. I, what, my personal philosophy on that is just eat less. Enjoy what you're eating. If you want a piece of cheesecake, eat a smaller piece if you're watching your sugar or watching your fat intake. Um, you know, sometimes substituting with, you know, there are some good sugar substitutes out there just to talk about sugar. Um, I don't use them. Um, just, like I said, just eat less. Enjoy, en enjoy that little piece of what you're eating because sometimes the flavor will change, the texture will change, and at the end of the day, if, if you're eating something that just doesn't taste good, it, 
what's the point? <laughs> No, everything was was sweet. This is all it was all well. Um, we did have one technical challenge, which was um, a savory dish. So uh, it was a tart to tan, and what that is is normally it's made traditionally it's made it's a French pastry made with apples. In in a skillet, you brown the apples with sugar and a little bit of water and maybe some spices, and it creates kind of like a caramel. And then you take a piece of puff pastry, put it on top, bake it in the oven, and then you flip it over. So when you flip it over, um, you have the pastry on the bottom, the apples on the top. So what they had us do was a savory tart to tan with shallots and a little balsamic vinegar and some thyme. So we did do one, one savory dish, but that was a technical. We weren't asked to come up with a recipe for anything savory. Well, Tina, thank you so much You're again welcome. for sharing your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. We do have some coffee and some cookies.